Good evening to the listening and viewing. Welcome to the Cipriani College of Corporate Studies, particularly Elma Francois Institute of Research and Debate series in commemoration of Labor Day 2022, team charting inclusive approach to recovery. Welcome to the first of a three-part series First, being transforming world of work, fourth industrial revolution. Never let a good crisis waste be in the second, carded for Tuesday, 14th, and bringing up the ray, the art and renaissance. Today, we have with us two panelists, one being Trevor Johnson. General Secretary, the Banking, Insurance, and General Workers Union, and Kesta Nanku, Chairman, Employers Consultative Association of Trinidad and Tobago. Presenters today are going to take some time to take us through what it means for the world of work in terms of the impact of the revolution. Feel free to ask questions. Answer. If not during the session, subsequent on this page. You can type questions in the chat box. Please be clear and concise and state which panelists you are directing your questions to. Like the video and subscribe to our YouTube channel and encourage the circle to familiarize themselves with the content of this particular webinar. Because most, if not all of our viewers are workers or to the working class. Today promises to be very interesting for all of us, even those who would have retired because the world of work does not cease time. So Trevor Johnson is gonna to speak to us for 20 minutes, during which time your questions can be sourced and direct your questions to him at the question and answer set. So today I want to welcome Mr. Johnson and Mr. Nan. The floor is yours, Mr. Johnson, for your presentation. Thank you so very much, uh, Janice, uh, Chair of this afternoon's uh, session. and. Uh, Welcome to my fellow panelists, uh, Keston, and good, good evening to our viewing and listening public. Uh, as indicated, uh, we'll be, I'll be having a brief presentation on the uh, issue or the topic transforming the world of work in the fourth industrial revolution. And basically just for context, when we talk about the fourth industrial revolution, I think everyone acknowledges that the world of work is changing and has changed. Uh, we are living in a very technological world. And what we see in today is a convergence of digital AI and biotechnologies, uh, and which is really accelerating significantly. Um, certainly over the past two years, we have had the, the we, we were certainly going very at a, at a rapid pace. But I think it's fair to say that the uh, global pandemic of COVID-19 would have, in a sense, thrust us significantly forward um, into a, a level in terms of issues like digitalization uh, and transformation of the whole uh, uh, application of what happens in the workplace. Um, in, the, in the corporate world, it also translates to a leveraging of economic power I think most of us are, are familiar with all the major uh, tech giants, uh, you know, Google, Microsoft, et cetera, et cetera. And what we seem to be seeing today is that that, that unrelenting push uh, um, after the harvesting of data and, 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 and the manipulation of same. So that we are in a very, the, the workplace today is really very different from what we, we know it. And it's, what we see happening as a result is that workers, workers are also seeking to get their own space, find their own space as they seek to 
deal with the whole issue of worker power in a digitalized age. Well, things are things are changing, and the employers are certainly seeking to uh, to sort of um, leverage, as it were, the whole aspect of, and the and the and the provision of the digitalized age. And you, as a result, you have, of course, workers and workers or organizations also chiming in, seeking to create a balance, as it were. Um, in, 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 in the workplace. So what we're looking at is, is um, today's presentation is going to focus, my presentation today is going to focus uh, significantly on exploring the experiences of work from home and other adjustments uh, to the world of work as a result of the pandemic. We're also going to look very briefly at the role use of technology in transforming the, the, the world of work and some of the, the lessons that would have been learned as a result of all of this. And the context, we I think we all know it, uh, you know, the, the, the COVID-19 crisis was declared as a pandemic by, by, by WHO in March of 2020. And as the situation worsened, of course, we would have come into scenarios like, you know, stay home order, orders, lockdown, et cetera in Trinidad and Tobago. For different countries, the time frame may have been slightly different, but largely speaking, that is what we were looking at. And this would have very quickly and rapidly uh, led us to the whole uh, issue of work from home and uh, remote work. And you know the terms as, uh, are very often these days used interchangeably. And when we talk about the whole concept of work from home, uh, this is basically work that is, uh, you, may, uh, you may work at an office, but during the pandemic, we quickly discovered that, that um, some employers made arrangements and, and therefore you were probably given a laptop or some digital device and in order to um, help you to be able to do some form of work from home, largely with the use of that uh, computer, uh, whether it be a desktop, laptop, um, or, or ta um, tablet, et cetera. And therefore, the, the term work from home basically um, came to, of course, refer to work that, that is done anywhere else except in your, in your workplace or, at your, or it's done primarily at your home. Um, for some people, they just take it to mean, well, work away from what is my normal uh, work office. And, and I think the ILO convention uh, C-177 on work from home would be, would be relevant in this context of how we, we conceptualize the whole uh, uh, aspect of, of work from, from home. What we saw as a result of, of, the, of the work from home arrangement was that there was a fairly rapid push towards uh, what uh, was this uh, declaration or terminology um, being declared by many employers and many, many persons in government, et cetera, as the new normal. So I, I think all of us have come to recognize and have become familiar with that term. And it may mean um, different things depending on, on you know, um, what, what view you have. But, but we did have this, this concept of the new normal, and that was to, to sort of push us towards an, an acceptance that life in the workplace or operations in the workplace um, was never going to be or never going to go back to, to what it was before. We had to accept concepts of work from home. We had to accept concepts of, of for example, uh, work rotations, which would have meant that uh, sometimes we would work at home, uh, maybe two or three days a week, and then sometimes we will report to the office, or it might be a, a week on, a week off, et cetera. But it was quickly referred to as the new normal. And in fact, you, you had um, organizations looking at the, the whole, what they would call the, the benefits of, of work from home. Uh, and some, some would, have, um, would have offered or indicated that, that um, perhaps for workers, one of the stated benefits of the work from home initiative uh, was one um, primarily one to protect their, their health, 
but it was also one which created some level or was said to create some level of um, of work life balance or also one which will allow which would have allowed them to to deal with and address family matters at the at the same time with the, with the flexibility of uh, doing their 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 stated tasks or work which they they would have been assigned from the employer side uh, some employers um, and organizations were viewing this new normal, as we called it, as in, in a sense, they were looking at, what, for example, uh, cost savings. They were looking at the, at the fact that, that, and you heard um, employers talking about, for example, and some employers actually got to that point. We know several who would have actually um, re-engineered the entire operation. And by that, I mean, Yes, as somewhere would have gone as far as to perhaps um, they were they were in a bigger in a big building they would have been able to um, maybe uh, um, acquire a smaller building because staff were now on rotation. Um, some employers would have would have clearly stated um, in internationally, for example, Twitter would have announced during the pandemic that that staff would be working from home on a permanent basis, and we're going to come back to look at some of the implications of that. So you so the, the work from home would have triggered a number of things and and it you know there would have been a number of uh, suggested benefits identified, not having to get into traffic on a daily basis, um, that being ha having that flexibility as one operated uh, from home, um, et cetera, et cetera. In some cases reduce hours of work and, and so forth. And um, Work from home uh, or remote work, as it is called sometimes, um, brought with it several challenges. And I think very early in the pandemic, uh, no less a person than the president of the industrial court uh, would, have, uh, would have been advising that any consideration for uh, COVID-19 workplace measures, whether these were to be considered permanent or intermittent measures, that there really needed to be a significant level of dialogue between unions or worker representatives, uh, between uh, employers, and of course, between government. In short, she was referring to the whole aspect of social dialogue of a tripartite nature, because she was basically, I think, issuing a caution before we rush to determine, well, this is permanent or, uh, you know, we implement, let us also uh, look at some of the considerations that is involved in this. In some, in, in, in some respect, we found that not everybody would have adhered to that, uh, that, that guidance being offered by the president of the court. And what we found as a result was an avalanche of IROs, industrial relation cases um, being filed at the industrial court as employers and unions and worker representatives sought to get some sort of redress out of the court. But you have to bear in mind, they themselves were facing their own challenges in terms of uh, the, the fact that this thing was unprecedented. Uh, the, 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 the global pandemic of, you know, of COVID-19 was un unprecedented. And basically, workplace jurisprudence in most cases did not, simply did not cater for all of the issues <clears throat> that would have arisen as a result of, <clears throat> of the global uh, pandemic. So let's just take a, a quick look at some observations and resources when we look at the, at the whole issue of working from home, starting from as simple as if you are asking a worker or, or assigning a worker to work from home, there are things that are needed, workstation, you know, pry up, up maybe an appropriate space where, where, where they can work, and you know, we recognize that during the pandemic, a lot of workers, when they worked from home, really found it challenging because they didn't always have what you consider that appropriate space. Some of us may be blessed with having a study or home office, but that is by and large, we found uh, from a worker's perspective in the minority. You had issues like uh, internet access, the bandwidth, you know, what is a, is a worker expected to have the appropriate bandwidth to deal with you know um you know the transfer of large files etc 
that they would normally have to deal with in the workplace. <clears throat> and then you had the, 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 the other issues, you know, computer and office accessories, stationary, remote access to files. And uh, in the event it was needed, where would the technological support come from? So the, these are all some almost immediate challenges that occurred, um, not suggesting that, that some of, some of the, the, the work from home arrangement may not have been a, a convenient one for some workers, but these are some basic and fundamental challenges that one found as we, as we looked at, at the whole issue of work from home. Um, when we, when we, we, we delve further into it, um, we have to consider when one is working from home, the aspect of family presence, because you, know, you work from home, you may have children attending remote school, et cetera. You may have a, a, an elderly um, parent or something to look after. And you know, so work from home, um, you have that family presence, which may be positive, but it also presented a challenge. And that would have led sometimes to maybe, depending on the construct of your home, confidentiality compromise in terms of uh, dealing with you know, private documents or client documents and how private could these be in a, in a home scenario as, of, as opposed to the uh, sanitized space, so to speak, of a work office where the, the appropriate protocols would, 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 would attend to legal liabilities in terms of um, what, what aspect, you know, what challenges could occur when one is working from home, uh, even though there may be largely digital files, but, but can there be aspects which can create liabilities for both the worker and or the organization um, at, at large? And then of course you have basic things, reporting time, supervision, you know, things like that which, which um, all for, based on actual reports coming in uh, will pose some challenges in, in some, some respects. And uh, when, as I said, when we look at the whole issue of technological support, which sometimes is critical uh, when one is, is, is operating in a largely digitalized setting, this is something that, that certainly needs to be looked at. Uh, some, 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 implications or further considerations uh, when, when one looks at it, the whole aspect of when you work in an office, most, work, most workers work, may work in a, in, in, in a team, in a department, et cetera. And um, we have had reports, uh, for example, of, of the whole issue of workers sometimes feeling isolated because they are still part of a team, but they are not seeing their team members because everyone is working remotely and remotely mean you're away from the office you may be able to send the, the average message here and there, but you're not actually seeing your colleagues on a day-to-day -day basis. So psychologists have reported that they have seen concerns arising out of, out of um, issues like not being able to bond with your team, physically bond with your team, for example. Um, we have had you know, issues such as screen time which is an issue even if you're in the office in terms of balance of screen time, how much time do you spend before the computer as opposed to doing some other tasks. Uh, but working from home, there seemed to have been a greater demand for workers to spend more and more time at the screen since they were not in the physical office. And this would have also posed some uh, challenges um, in, in, in terms of getting this new normal, you know, looking at all the aspects. And, and one of the things that is, that is very critical, we feel, when we talk about the work from home arrangement is that there, there was, this thing happened so quickly that there was really no legislative framework or very little legislative framework to provide the appropriate protection and guidance, not just for workers, but for employers as well, in terms of, of in the workplace, in the if home is to become the workplace, if home is going to become a new normal workplace, then there, there are several things that one has to consider. And in fact, recently um, I saw um, a case, not in our jurisdiction, where there was a health and safety issue that occurred 
and I believe a, a, a court actually ordered compensation uh, to a worker who was actually injured at home, but whilst at work, because the court was arguing, your home is now the new workplace, and the injury took place during the hours, let's say it was eight to four, when the worker would have been at work. So they fell at home, and um, the matter was taken apparently to the court, and the court said, yes, the, the, um, to the company, you have to make good on this, on this worker's injury. So I don't think employers are necessarily looking at things like that, or some employers may, may not be looking at things like that. And therefore, we have to, we have to consider that in, in going forward. And uh, when we look at the whole aspect of this increasing digitalization, remote work, work from home, as it as it you know as it as it as it multiplies, as it as it ac uh, accelerates, and 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 this definition of of work is not something we do, but or, or is something we do rather. It's not a place that we go to. So again, this concept is rapidly taking hold where you don't really have a physical workspace at an office per se. No. What is important for us as an employer is what you do. Um, we, we assign you task, um, project work, and how you are able to complete that. But of course, we have to also consider that not every worker is able to complete their work task depending on the nature of their job or will be able to actually operate from home. And therefore, one also has to factor that in and strike a balance. How do you determine which workers from your organization physically work remotely or work away from the office and which workers would be required as a matter of necessity to physically report to work on a daily basis? And how do we reconcile the, 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 the two? Because there may be a perceived, I use the word carefully, perceived advantage of some people saying, well, person X is, is not required to report for work on X days or how many days, but I am, I am being required to report for work on a daily basis. So that is something food for thought for employers to have to consider. And as we consider the whole aspect of digitalization and the increasing leverage of what that brings, you have concerns of, of job loss. We saw recently, for example, that Scotia Bank announced that 149 workers were to be sent home. And this at the same time that the bank was declaring an, in, an increased level of digitalization in its operations. So that there's this concern that is this new normal? Is this uh, fourth industrial revolution? Um, is it one that is going to threaten my job? Because uh, no less a person than, than, than Stephen Hawkins is reported to have said some time ago, whilst he embraced digitalization and artificial intelligence, et cetera, he reportedly um, said that he saw it leading to, and I quote the term, job destruction. In other words, he was saying you need to strike a balance. If, you're going to, if we are going to be entering into this digitalized realm of this fourth industrial revolution, then it cannot be one that leads to job destruction, leads to retrenchment. At the end of the day, um, it, too many people basically seem to be uh, 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 facing the threat of job loss. And there's this indication, well, no problem, other jobs are on the horizon. But the reality is um, we are not seeing those jobs, new jobs emerging necessarily as quickly enough as the jobs that are being lost. And again, this is this is something that would have to be to be uh, looked at, because as we say, in in, in an increasingly digital digi digitalized world, uh, many workers um, they may be seeing up an opportunity to reconcile family and social goals through a hybrid arrangement, work from home, remote work. But we also have to look at the caution um, inserted as several employers have, have and naturally, they, what they may argue, hastily latched on to this new normal. But uh, in, in many cases, it has been done without the benefit of a full risk assessment and an effective scan and analysis of all the factors, uh, including legal issues that need to be considered. 
So I, I would like to uh, just it, um, end here. I, I know that we will have an opportunity for uh, questions and comments and, and so forth. And uh, maybe at that point, I would be able to expand on certain points. But I certainly want to thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to share this brief presentation. And I will hand back over to our, our uh, chair for this evening session. So Janice, back to you. Thanks so much, Trevor. And from this experience, I can see you're a person to time. It took exactly 19 and a half minutes for a 20 minute presentation. Thank you so much. It went by pretty, pretty quickly. I took a lot of notes, you know, see me smiling through some of it because some of the questions that you're seeing, um, some of the topics you were touching on is that you contemplating or to the IELTS. Uh, we would source the question and answer segment at the end um, just to ensure that we get to hear from both sides of the fence because we know you're talking from a union or worker perspective to hear what Tester has to say in terms of employers and, and how they view impact of the sports revolution on us and therefore without any delay, I want to call on Kester to share his presentation. Kester? Thank you very much, Kester. Uh, yeah, Madam Chairperson. <laughs> thank you. Uh, let me extend a warm congratulations to my colleague, Conrad. <laughs> very, very interesting presentation. Very, very interesting. And um, as the moderator indicated, well researched. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want to give I want to express a special thanks for this opportunity to share some thoughts with the members of the audience, the listening public, and so on. On this very, what has become a very, I don't want to use the word contentious, but a, a, a very critical um, juncture at which we we now, as my colleague indicated, this new this new normal. Back in 2016, and I was very surprised as I was doing my research <laughs> to put this, this presentation together. Back in 2016, a World Bank report indicated that two thirds jobs is susceptible to automation. This is before the pandemic. <laughs> okay, this is before the pandemic. And more than that, this fourth industrial revolution, again, it was described by my colleague as, a, as the new normal, but put another way, it, it is the most extensive experiment in history, the most extensive in history. Next slide, could you uh, put it in presentation mode for me, please? Uh, Yeah, if it if it can be put in presentation mode. Okay, so so whilst that is and and, and bring it forward so that I can see what what I'd be sharing with you here this evening is the role we're going to examine the role and use of technology in transforming the world of work. What were the lessons learned? And what recommendations that we can make to ensure that neither worker nor employer is disadvantaged as a result of the adjustment? Because basically, we are operating in a time, if we want to, to make it better, we got to improve, we got to be prepared on both sides, both on the, the, the trade union side and also the employer side, we've got to be prepared to make sacrifices and adjustments. And again, this industrial revolution was occasioned by the introduction of so much, of quite a bit of automation, artificial intelligence, 
auto ro robotics. And uh, what is being said, to, to, what is being told to us is that this introduction of automation is going to create a lot of new jobs while displacing traditional ones. Now, my colleague mentioned that the pace at which this is this should be taking place is not is not where it should be, and quite naturally, one would expect that <laughs> in some countries they were late in getting out of the blocks. I would like to suggest that, that we were a bit late in getting out of the blocks also. In addition to that, today's skills will not match the jobs of tomorrow. And newly acquired skills, quite naturally, may quickly become obsolete. That therefore means that as an employer, we need to pay attention and focus on reskilling, retooling, in some instances, re-engineering some of the jobs that we have in the workplace. Now, again, we have the belief that new jobs requiring new skills will be created. And as employers, I'm of the view that there is a level of responsibility that individuals got to take. You know, far too often, we rely heavily on the employer to provide us with training and development and retooling and upskilling. But I think we are in a time where initiatives, the individual got to take his or her own initiative to improve and to make that investment in developing his or her skills and competencies. So it means that we need to seize the opportunities that will emerge from the transformative changes if we are to create a brighter future and to deliver economic security and equal opportunity for all. Teleworking is one of the, the, the modalities that we have been forced to adopt. I don't want to go into the details again because my colleague took some time to go into it, the why of it. But we need to keep in mind that resilience is, a, is going to be very important particularly in terms of planning, and also that, that, that human spirit that is going to be necessary. Put another way, I would like to strongly say, suggest that we got to pay attention in this new world of work to how we show up. <laughs> how we show up is not just about, well, I start work at, at, at four, I end at, at, at seven, more as the case might be. As a matter of fact, this, this experiment, this new normal is demanding much more time because people are at their homes. And not to say that as an employer, <laughs> we expect you to go, you know, exceedingly long hours, but at the same time, you know. It's important, and that's where performance management, if I may fast forward, performance management becomes so critical. How do you manage the, 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 the jobs being performed at home in this teleworking environment? That is one of the challenges that, that, that employers, even in my own organization, um, where I consult at Guardian, um, supervisors, managers are, are asking, when are these people going to be uh, returned to work? You know, and that is a signal that the performance management system, the way how we manage performance in the past, cannot 
be the same, we cannot use the same approach to managing performance in a teleworking world. I mean, there are so many benefits, as Trevor alluded to, you know, um, traveling to and from work, the time you spend, the unproductive time and so on. And, and as a consequence of that, you find many people are really enjoying the teleworking environment, not because it's it not necessarily because they're operating from home, but they feel a sense of accomplishment. They, they, they feel that they're being more productive because they're seeing results. As Trevor alluded, the other side of the coin, <laughs> which is one of the things that, that we are grappling with, again, at, at my place at Guardian, is when an injury takes place <laughs> at the home, what happens, you know? The, the, the whole liability issue, but I'm sure that somebody would be posing a question on it, yeah? Let's, let's look at some, some, some data from the, that the ECA collected from our constituents in terms of the responses to this teleworking. And this is in 2020 and 2021. Some interesting findings among our membership, more than 70% who were surveyed, 70% of the respondents in 2020 indicated that the figure was, I'm sorry, that, the, that prior to the pandemic, remote work was not available at that time. This figure was reversed during the heights of the pandemic with over 70% of respondents indicating that they had to implement some degree quite naturally because it became regulatory, okay? In 2021, close to half of the respondents indicated that remote work would remain up an option after the pandemic. Organizations such as the ILO highlighted that expanded use of remote work may not end with the pandemic, but could instead become incorporated as one of the many new normals, as my colleague alluded to. And we are seeing it today, a new feature of an increased globalized world, which is seeing shifts towards all sorts of, of, of challenges being posed at the place of work. And, both, and, and outside of the place of work, at the homes, you know, the skill sets <laughs> that, that, that are required. How are we going to get people up and running with taking advantage of opportunities? Again, you, you, you hear, you keep hearing or seeing advertisements where, where employer employment uh, workers are wanted, but yet for all, you know, we continue to have these challenges with you know, employers complaining or, or expressing the view that we are unable to, to fill vacancies and all the rest of it. And what you find, what we find happening is that, that there is a, those who have tasted the, the teleworking, working from home, you know, are finding it a bit challenging when the employer says, well, you know what, the envi my environment is now safe and you've got to return to work. So that, that is one of the things that we need to be very mindful of. How do we bring a balance to bear on working from home with, with its challenges, its benefits, and what are some of the things that, given the fact that it's a new normal and it's not gonna end with the pandemic, how do we plan and prepare for that? A large scale study by McKinsey Institute found that automation of activities and new technologies can enable businesses to improve performance by reducing errors, improving quality and speed, and in some cases, even achieve outcomes that go beyond capabilities. Moreover, the research demonstrates that technology can generate massive return on investment, as McKinsey said, between 13 to 25% for individuals and businesses that invest in IT training. Let me now shift quickly to 
COVID-19 and beyond. Lessons learned. The only, only one thing remains constant as we know is change. Our ability to respond to the crisis and our capacity to adapt to them. Many of organizations had to move quickly to adopt. The COVID-19 pandemic has also taught us that resilience planning is critical. Therefore, at the end of the day, we cannot underestimate the importance of resources and safety nets. While many of us had the means to, trans to transition online work, many organizations could not do. Another set of data collected from the e by the ECA revealed that 27% of the membership saw between 10 and 25% decrease in revenue, 30% reported decrease, um, decreases between 25 to 50% from the perspective of workers, many had to grapple with decreased earnings, which placed them further at risk. The question must now, therefore now be asked, where do we go from here? What are the recommendations going forward in discussing the future of work? It becomes blaring that those who are able to reskill and retool will be best prepared for the future of work. Labor and educational policies must consider and ensure there's effective responsiveness from educational systems in facilitating reskilling, retooling, and upskilling. Policy frameworks, as my colleague alluded, need constant monitoring and evaluation to continuously anticipate skills needs. Framework also need to explore innovative pathways in technology and vocational education. While there may be many challenges ahead, my friends, we should not be daunted. Social dialogue is the most powerful vehicle and it sits at the center of the future that we wanna create. And therefore, many would describe the fact that this fourth revolution is so disruptive. But what I wanna share with you this after, say to you this afternoon on this call, let us use disruption to improve people's lives, not to destroy it. It means that collaboration is so critical. We got to keep in mind both as an employers and also the trade union movement who are also employers, that our values define us. It is not about, it's not only about ideas, it is about making ideas happen. This whole teleworking, the new normal and so on. I'm saying all this, my friends, to say that we need to embrace change through dialogue, through social dialogue. And in conclusion, we need to remember that trusted relationships go beyond. Trusted relationships go beyond. And what we are talking about here, the conversation we are engaging, where there's teleworking, working from home, some people at the work environment, it's all, it's trust is the crucible that is going to hold this together. Trusted relationships go beyond. I wanna thank you for listening and, and, and Love to get your questions um, when the time comes. Thanks a lot, and thanks for the opportunity. Thanks so much for that presentation, Kester. I know for a fact that these two panelists are very time conscious. So I know your business oriented persons. All right. Um, a lot was said. Uh, there's a question coming in, and it's either um, any of the panelists can, can answer. So the comment is many organizations resisted flexible hours from home prior to the pandemic. They were forced to end the pandemic. Do you think there is room for a proper evaluation of work from home? so that it can be a permanent future or fixture in the work relationship. There are many works 
who felt more productive and less stress working from home. When you eliminate the three hour commute, for example. And I think both panelists would have alluded to that in terms of the traffic congestion and the temperament of workers when they get into the workplace having to face traffic on their way there. Some, sometimes how it impacts the family having worked all day and having to, to commute in the traffic, getting home. How do you see us as a nation adapting to that aspect of flexibility? Any, 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 any person can. Okay, well, um, perhaps I would just um, make an initial comment on this because from what I understand, the, um, the person asking the question is focusing on, on the whole aspect of flexibility or flexible work hours, et cetera, which was not as prevalent before the pandemic, but which seemed to have been sort of um, become a, a, a feature that we were gravitating to during the pandemic. And um, so I'd start off by saying that um, the, the whole process of the world of work is evolving as we see it as a result of, uh, and I said significantly sort of advanced by the, by the necessity caused during the pandemic. Um, there are a number of things I know that, that have to be looked at, for example, um, in, in unionized um, uh, work environments, you have the issue of um, collective agreements with specific time frames, et cetera, so that it, it, will, it will require um, dialogue between both the employer and the, and the respective worker organization or trade unions um, in, in, in some cases, because you have to look at what are the current terms and conditions and how these can be, can be varied, et cetera. Um, the challenge with some of this is that very often in an organization, and unions will tell you this, you, you have one set of workers being very uh, gung-ho and ready to embrace a certain um, thing or feature, but then you may have another set of workers who, for various reasons, may not so easily embrace it. And therefore, it becomes a balancing act with the work organization and trade union having to look at this, having to dialogue, having to have some levels of consultation within its own membership. So, so just to, as, as a starter, that is sometimes one of the things that have to be, would, would, would have to be looked at. And then um, the whole issue of flexibility. So I, I think both, both uh, myself and Kirsten would have is, uh, referenced the whole issue of um, supervision at home as opposed to supervision when you are in the workplace. And in the main, we have found that, that um, the, the average worker will, will um, produce significantly, in some cases even more, because they are in an environment where they are comfortable if they consider home to be, uh, or remote work to be that place. But you may also have, maybe this is in the minority, issues of supervisory challenges, because admittedly we have heard of cases where um, some organizations have reported they have significant difficulty um, being able to determine um, the, the level of productivity, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so these are just, uh, you know, these are just a couple immediate uh, observations, not necessarily all challenges, but observations that one has to, to engage when we're looking at the whole aspect of flexibility what does it mean? How flexible is flexible? There are some people who tell you they do their, they, they do their best work at midnight. Right, but right. then who is, who is to supervise them at midnight if, right, they are, yes. if they are to get up at maybe 10 p.m. and work till 2 a.m.? And, and so the, the, the workplace or the management structure of the workplace will have to be one which can effect new systems of monitoring and, 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 and to, to enable to be sure that the, 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 whatever the task that will assign to the worker is delivered. So just to end, there are some, some uh, managers and organizations will tell you, all they want is the, you know, the, they give you a deliverable Good. and they give you a time frame, and they're not interested in how, when you do it, once it's delivered with, on, on the time frame. But not every organization, the structure of every organization may have that level of flexibility. So it requires policy changes, policy, new policy initiatives, and it does require social dialogue 
in summary, between the worker, uh, even where there's no trade union, it still requires uh, levels of dialogue between the worker and the, the employer and their representative. Thank you. Esther, any comment? Because sure, I have two questions sure, coming in for you directly. <laughs> sure, just to, just to add to, to Trevor's um, comments. Um, Let's look at it from the principle. And I think we have, ex we have now come to accept that the new world of work, the teleworking is going to be one of the features and the most, a, a very important feature. And therefore, one can reasonably expect through a process of collaboration and consensus between parties, and it does not necessarily have mean that you need to have um, a trade union, you know, or, or representative. I think that a lot of organizations you hear talking about in terms of, of, of their values, people-centered, people focus, you know. And if you are operating from that principle, therefore one would expect that the collaboration and how you arrive at what is best for, in, for both parties is the way that we're gonna to have to go. We are not going to be able, you know, even at the end of this pandemic, because what we have recognized is that infrastructure and all the rest of it, most of, look at the Caribbean, you know, how many countries in the Caribbean can, can boast about infrastructure, you know, that can support, um, the continuation of people, you know, having to commute to work back and forth and the relative impact upon bringing up children in the home, you know, people having, um, leaving home early in the morning, getting home late in the, late at night to get up four o'clock in the morning to get. So I think at the end of the day, this teleworking principle has to be expanded but to expand it, we need parties to the conversation to come and arrive at a common shared understanding as to exactly what is required going forward, because it's something that we, we ought to begin to prepare to live with. Yes, then I have two questions coming in for you, but more or less you're preempted one of the thing I was, um, things that stood out to me because less than 22% of our working population um, Unionize and therefore you ask the question whether or not consultation has to be wide, wider than beyond the trade union. And I, I hear you talking about management um, contemplating what's best for both sides. In essence, they want to become that employer of choice, so they chart the course. There are two questions coming here for you, Keston. Uh, the comment, the commentary is saying organizations in both the public and private, and you need not answer any particular, and you can choose which one you answer at any point in time, all right? They're asking that both public and private sector have already re-engineered their processes, but job descriptions remain largely unchanged. Is this not inequity? And another question is asking about the responsibility for evaluating productivity and whether the ECA would lead the charge and what specifically suggested needs to be changed. So one is speaking about evaluating productivity and the other, and I think they're, they're linked in terms of re-engineering This one that's coming in. Uh, yeah, well, let me take let, let me take the re-engineering. And you're quite right. It, it, they're all linked. If you're re-engineering, you know, the how the way work is performed and delivered, therefore it stands to reason that having revisiting your job documents must be an integral part or should be an integral part of the whole re-engineering process. I, I would be very surprised if, you know, anyone attempts to argue that 
I'm re-engineering. I am changing the job. But the most important tool to support the re-engineering process is tell me what I need to do. What, what, what are the expectations? You know, and that is where the performance management comes in because performance management is about providing clarity around the expectations, what I want you to do. Because if I don't do that, then I'm going to be having challenges. You, 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 you are not, you may not necessarily be in a position to deliver on your task objectives <laughs> because you, there's a sufficient clarity around it. So I think it's important that re-engineering, restructuring, reorganizing, that employers got to sit down and recognize that the first place, and in the first place, that you need to tell the employee what he or she is expected to do. And in the absence of that, <laughs> you know, there will be gray areas, and those gray areas would lead to employee relations issues at the end of the day. Well, you didn't, what you told me to do, I didn't understand it this way, and I didn't understand it that way. In terms of productivity, um, as you know, we have had um, at the national level consultations tri at the tripartite level, national tripartite level consultations on productivity and all the rest of it. Again, and I, I must say that's a great question because what it does is bring in, it brings into focus the need at a national level to recognize, to really do a complete and thorough assessment of the benefits that have been derived, both socially, psychologically, and economically, insofar as teleworking is concerned, the whole lecture. There are so many benefits. <laughs> you know, the whole psyche of people coming to the place of work, you know. So yes, I would strongly recommend and strongly suggest, and I can tell you the ECA has been doing a lot of work, if I may say so myself, you know, with its constituents and speaking to that at whatever forum that the ECA has a seat, yeah? All right, I just have a follow-up question for you, Keston, before I ask sure. Trevor to comment. So sure. how can someone, confident of job security if they were not given the opportunity to prove their ability to work from home? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm chuckling because <laughs> Trevor would tell you, although the union would argue that there's nothing as job security. You as the individual, you got to first see that as your responsibility by ensuring that you are prepared you know, it is said that when opportunity comes, it's too late to prepare. So this has to be put into the psyche of every single, not just workers, every single individual must see himself or herself as a person of value who can deliver value. So then this whole question of job security, I can, I can give you a job. I can offer you a job, but I can't guarantee you that you will have that job for the rest of your life. You, there are things, ownership and responsibility that you got to take and accept in order to, so the control of, of, of um, security resides in your hands. Thanks, Keston. Trevor, any comments? Yeah, well, <clears throat> let me just take the um, deal with the last point first, because whilst it's fresh in my my mind, because I think clearly, Kessa and I would have a divergence of views there. I think when the average worker in Trinidad and Tobago speaks about job security, um, they may not necessarily be talking about a job for the rest of their, their life, but they're certainly talking about a job that is contrary to what we are seeing now, a lot of short-term contracts, one month, three months, six month, one year contracts, and there's no certainty 
even as to when and how that contract will be renewed so that um, job security, as Kestam may have said, I may not be quoting him, may be something for you to determine in your heart and mind, but there's a practical outworking of job security that the average worker is looking at so that when they go to get a loan from the bank, they can't take a job, a job letter that says they're on a six month contract and they want a loan for three years. They want to apply to the US embassy or whatever for a visa, they need to show that they have something that ties them to Trinidad and Tobago. That's not a six month contract. That's not a, that's not a, a one, year, one year contract. So there are some practical outworkings. We have always said that the, 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 the whole mechanism of, of what government and what um, the, the state needs to ensure, if you're pushing towards um, moving away from traditional jobs, then you can't have all, the, all the, the systems that we work with, the institutions that we work with still demanding these so-called traditional things. You, you, in a contract job, you can't get a loan or sex, et cetera. And I, I, I know I don't want to belabor the point, but I think you <clears throat> hopefully on, um, understanding what I mean. So that when that worker speaks about job security and in the context of a digitalized world, et cetera, it's like the reference I made to the workers earlier of, of Scotia Bank. They would have worked long and hard to ensure that the organization met its, um, its, its, um, its objectives. And here, lo and behold, once the organization has achieved it, 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 its, its objectives, then we hear 149 workers to be retrenched because they are no longer needed. So those are concerns um, people would have. And just to jump in or chime in, and there was some reference to the whole issue of, um, the, again, flexibility and job descriptions. And the, we, we have to recognize that most employers in, in Trinidad and Tobago, and I imagine globally, um, COVID-19 created, in a sense, a doctrine of necessity. They were forced to change. But the systems, such as the policies and the um, job evaluation systems and so, <clears throat> have not kept up with that speed. Of, of what, what that necessity for them to put people to work from home, et cetera. So that um, it will take some time. I'm not saying forever, but that's what I'm saying. I said earlier in my presentation, um, whilst employers would have rushed to embrace the new normal, because there were aspects of it certainly would have been attractive to employers, as I admit that there would have been aspects of it that would have appeared attractive to workers. But there needs to be a thorough assessment of this. And I would suggest most employers have not necessarily been able to review their, their job descriptions and review things like that or their job evaluation systems or their, their, their strategic approach to reorganizing how they operate so that the, the new normal would, would have thrust us into a, a sense of urgency to do um, some immediate things, but it has not necessarily allowed employers as yet. Do I acknowledge, Kesten has said, you know, the, the EC is assisting in many ways, but the average employer, and in our experience, certainly from a union perspective, would, have not, would not have reached the stage where they can make those strategic adjustments um, that are required if we are to go the route of what we are referring to as the new normal. Uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm Trevor, if I may, I also want to, to chime in in terms of changing or the change we see in terms of the employee, um, employer relationship in terms of contract of service, which we know the court through a process of determining what is a contract of a contract for, um, in terms of that control test and integration test with that remote worker. Uh, we also see the issue of the transfer of the cost of production to the worker as opposed to the employer. Um, the question is whether or not that can be factored in when you are contemplating their compensation packages. And this is whether the unit is or not nice. And I'm highlighting that simply because I'm hearing the ECA's voice in terms of a collaborative approach and understanding and accepting the the trade the unionized workers are in the minority and therefore the unions advocating for their membership literally 
they are in the minority. And therefore we are asking the employers. There are benefits to both sides, we, we accept that. But for the most part, we see the benefits in terms of the employer, their operation cost has been transferred, not decreased, it has been transferred to the worker where they now have to pay the electricity bill because if nobody's at home, it means I can switch everything off. There's so many other things that are affecting the worker. Looking at the need to monitor versus the aspect of privacy, which is a constitutional right of the worker. So while you can monitor what I do, how of the, much of the sanctity of my home space have I lost in terms of this employment relationship? There's so, and I want to agree with Keston, consultation is important if you bring about this aspect of equity in that employment relationship because you're there. Um, you definitely can see what aspect of, from the employer's perspective, confidentiality. Who is liable for the security of your information and your files? Yes, we talk about the hours of work and that support. This issue of isolation and mental health, how many are contemplating employees assistance program because we know what shut-ins can do. All right, we know the work. This is more than just task and pay. It is also an aspect of socialization that has been lost. Issue of work-life balance. So there's so much to be contemplated in this change, in this thought shun. But what I want to also ask you to contemplate this aspect of loss of jobs and what does that mean in terms of the price of labor? I know the union may contemplate that in one regard and the employer in another. Is this an opportunity for diversification? Is it an opportunity not to re-engineer your processes but to create new streams of jobs and utilize the talent? I hear Keston in terms of the for making himself more marketable and more competitive, right, in the world of work. But this aspect of, let's take, for example, teaching. Teaching. They were forced to go into remote work. Yes, and there's so many issues coming out from there because in terms of provision of resources, tools and equipment, so yes, you hear him uh, managing performance, but remember managing performance is 50% support, not just measuring. Most of people talk about managing, hear them talk about measurement and not necessarily managing. So these are so many issues that are contemplated. But Trevor, while you're on, there's a question here for you in terms of data gathering, all right? And what is the trade union movement doing to address the inevitability of job loss through automation? And do you see any shift in education to prepare for a new skill set? Okay, well, yeah, first of all, the on the issue of um, data harvesting, um, this is something that the, the, um, the trade union umbrella bodies, um, the trade union federations, both locally and especially internationally. My union, for example, is affiliated to Uni Global Union, which is the largest um, trade union federation in, in the world. And one of the things I know they, they would have been strong on since, uh, since in the last decade, 20, long before COVID for the records, 2010, 2012, is looking at the whole issue of um, data harvesting and, for example, concerns, um, for example, of, of employers using digital technology to gather um, information on, on staff, et cetera, who controls, uh, looking at questions of who controls this data is it, for example, on the employer's server, or is it being held by a secondary or an outsourced entity? And therefore, because we hear so much these days, for example, about hacking and people's information, um, sometimes even their financial data or their personal data being compromised. Uh, so, so this is something I know that the not just the the Uni Global Union, the International Confederation of Trade Unions, and most of the umbrella. Um, trade union federations are working together with. I know that the ILO is also looking at this and individual trade unions that that sort of, um, you know, sort of um, tune in to these or, or affiliate members of, of these organizations is something that we are looking at. I, I know at the local level as well, it, 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 it has been raised and you touched earlier just quickly on the whole aspect of um, 
privacy and how much um, in terms of monitoring um, what, what can be done. So you'd find that several of our collective agreements would speak to that, the whole issue of monitoring, um, the whole issue of management and control or, or employers being required to share with the union bodies, et cetera, um, in terms of processes that are in place for the whole aspect of gathering data, which can be very um, confidential or critical for, for, for workers, their medical data, et cetera. So, so there, there, there are these concerns because the reality is uh, most of the major tech giants seem to control approximately 90% of data, you know, global data, um, even government data. And, and, and there are certainly concerns about that. Um, so, so it's something that we are conscious of, we are actively engaging in and looking at. And in some cases, if you examine some local collective agreements, across different unions and sectors, you'd already find that there are elements or clauses in there that are seek that have addressed that. And of course, are seeking to improve on tightening up to give workers the satisfaction that their data is, uh, is in, in a sense, there's some level of control that it isn't outsourced, et cetera. So that's, that's one thing. And then just to touch quickly um, on the whole aspect of um, job security and so on, because so far the conversation, we have talked about unions and we have talked a lot about employers, but we must not, we cannot allow government to get away because government seems to be um, engaging in a, well, we don't get involved in this, we don't get involved in that, but government has to be a facilitator of sort in terms of these things. So if you, you talk about upskilling and, and retraining, et cetera, and um, one of the concerns we certainly have as a union, as a labor body is, that's why the whole issue of gate was important. Um, so it's important for individuals to take the initiative to get upskilled and upgraded, but they do need support at times. So this is where an aspect of gate, because the way gate, gate has virtually been made, has made it foot, the way gate is, has been re-engineered or, or constructed now, makes it very difficult for persons to get support um, from the state in order to assist them with reskilling, retooling, et cetera. So in my, in, 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 in my view and the, the view of, of the labor movement, um, government has a role as a facilitator um, to provide and point to the institutions where workers can be reskilled or upskilled. They have a role perhaps through the facility of GIT to ensure that we have a, 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 a and I call it literate, not in the not in the traditional sense, but in terms of being, um, um, you have workers who are multi-skilled, multi-talented, so that not just academically, but through tech work and other skills that should one door close, they can easily access another. And, and we're not seeing that happening. So what you're seeing is that workers are being retrenched. We are hearing announcements of retrenchments almost on a weekly or monthly basis. And we know for a fact that many of those workers do not yet have the level of reskilling or tooling that would easily allow them to, to, to sort of access another job easily. So yes, I hear Keston is there. there um, they have to take the initiative, but it also requires some, some facilitation by government. <clears throat> and government has to listen to this and ensure that they they engage their responsibility as well in, in this process. Yes, you know, as you, as you uh, Janice, and, and, and thanks for that, um, taking us here. What about a national manpower plan? <laughs> I mean, almost immediately, and I can tell you, I have sat at, at, at for a, where we talk about that till the cows come home. To your point, Janice, and if we are to be, if we are to get serious about creating a brighter and better future for all, we need to sit down and stop talking about a national manpower plan and for God's sake, quite naturally, it has to be tripartite in nature for obvious reasons. 
and speak to that. So when we talk about so many jobs are going to be lost as a result of automation, like the Scotia Bank case and all the rest of it, that national manpower plan will not just help people from school, you know, the various levels, understand where they should be focused or where they should begin to focus in terms of career development, okay? But in addition to that, that manpower plan would be able to accelerate a lot of the young people who today are pretty much <laughs> out on the streets, not knowing where the next where the next um, opportunity is going to come. What about our tech vop? What about our youth camps? Yeah, where are those? Where are those? I know that they have spoken about um, refurbishing and building them and whatever it is. Where are the toolsmen? Where are the tradesmen that we, we, we had in abundance? Okay. We got to throw a national manpower plan, create opportunities, not just for helping young people or individuals to, to better direct their career, okay? And to create opportunities, but that national manpower plan should also be supported <laughs> by, as Trevor indicated, the, 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 the government really, and I'm not saying here, yeah, don't get me wrong, that the government must, must jump in and do everything. But I think that there is a role in terms of, you know, infrastructure and all the rest of it in order to facilitate, you know, let us start actioning this conversation that we hear, you know, every so often about a national development uh, manpower plan. Whilst jobs are being lost, people are losing their jobs. What we are creating is a vicious cycle rather than a virtuous cycle where people have opportunities. You know, what are we waiting on? And, and I'm happy that you spoke about data because that data <laughs> is gonna be, I mean, right now I'm sitting on a, on a UN, um, sponsored program that's speaking to data where it's going to be um, reinvigorating the work of the CSO, the Central Statistical Office, <laughs> which, you know, where's the data? Where is the data? So Janice, you, you, you're absolutely correct in data to direct and inform, you know, and I'm saying, I'm suggesting that we need to stop just talking about a national manpower plan. But for God's sake, let's put our intentions into actions, you know? It's interesting because I, I want to tag on to a point, um, you keep hammering home and I'm in agreement with that in terms of collaboration. So my question is, when the trade union movement looks away from that tripartite arrangement in terms of what? discussion, how do we get them back to that wrong table for discussion? And when I say I'm tripartite, we talk about government union and employer, but we have other actors in area. For instance, the media, what part are they playing in our powerful media is? How much are we prepared to engage other stakeholders in this struggle? I don't want to call it a fight, in this struggle, because something is affecting all of us. Right, whether directly or indirectly, is willing to lead that charge. We're looking at, and we say, you're not expecting government to do, but we know government is the largest employer and they set the tone for the employment environment. So let's look at the issue. A question is posed about the salaries and the stagnation of salaries and the purchasing power of the dollar, uh, the erosion of it. Um, persons having not only to take on additional expenses coming out from this fourth revolution, they also have to sustain their families with less than. 
do we need to re-engineer income in the new normal as if we are if we are to avoid destroying people? So here we are in a situation where some let's use public sector, for instance, they're working for 2013 pay in 2022. And I want to use teachers as the example that would have had to transition unnecessarily. So I think it's either you Trevor raised the issue of the necessity, doctrine of necessity. But what does that mean for the socioeconomic standing of the respective employee having to take upon themselves burden of delivering to the citizenry and their salaries are stagnated? ECA trade union, to what extent are we prepared to come together and say to government and other employers, listen, do what is right, what is reasonable, it is just, it is fair. And don't wait for the industrial court to do it. I don't know if I, I brought it too much, but I think it's a conversation that we need to have. This yeah, yeah, yeah. And you see, what when people have um, disposable income, what you're in fact doing by extension is creating a circular flow of money so that, for example, the informal sector, which is the fastest growing sector, okay? Where are people, and you have so many people um, depending on that sector for employment, okay? But in order for that sector to, to, to be able to strive. sustain, to strive, one, you need to have disposable income where people can spend and spend in power so that, you know, that circular flow of money could increase the, 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 the economic um, growth of the country. So you're quite right. I, I, I'm a firm believer that, 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 you know, particularly given where we are, we recognize that Yes, some, some, some organizations have been forced to close as a result of the relative impact. But as we, as we come out gradually, I think it's, it's fair for us, both labor and employer, of which the government is the largest employer, to have that conversation about, we recognize, the realities that you are facing. This is how we are prepared to support. And I'm sure that there are ways, <laughs> I mean, there are ways that we can in fact, and as you say, without, without the positional bargaining kind of thing, because we are all in this together. If we wanna create that circular flow, that will feed into sustainable economic growth at the end of the day and, and development. Trevor? Yes, well, this is certainly, um, this, this may take another entire session, but um, let, let me just, uh, <clears throat> just start by saying that um, not just for my own union, but I'm also the Assistant General Secretary of the Joint uh, Trade Union Movement. And I think I could safely um, um, speak and, and, and say that, that we definitely, and we have publicly rejected the position of the government and the CPO in terms of the current um, positions being, being, being put and offered to workers in the public service and the public sector. Um, simply put, as you, you quite rightly said, and Heston, we are, we are in 2022 and we cannot be paying 2022 prices because the prices are current. Huh? The prices that we pay in 2022, because people tell you about the global supply chain and the cost of wheat and all, all you know, they talk about all the, all the various inputs and this has gone up in, in this country. They talk about the war in Ukraine and all of that is to justify why, why the prices in 2022 must be what they are. And, and, and they, they justify that. They know, nobody makes apologies for the prices that are being, being um, charged to you in 2022. So why are we still having a conversation about 2013 and 2014 salaries? Why are the workers of Cipriani College, the, the, the academic staff still on 20, 
07 salaries. This is the Labor College of, 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 of Trinidad and Tobago. Why it's, why it's, it's, it's academic, sorry, it's administrative staff still on 2010 salaries or, or the workers of CARDI on 2004 salaries. Because the, these, these are not just complaints by, by a trade union, or these are legitimate questions we must ask ourselves. These, these are legitimate questions that the government has to, has to ask itself. And this institution called the CPUI, say it's an institution, whether it is, is, is relevant to the current times that, that we are in or the process of some ministerial team. And so you talk to the CPO, but the CPO says he can't talk to you and unless he gets, um, he or she gets okay. instructions um, okay. from, from government. But yet we are being told that the CPO is the person to talk to. But when you go to the CPO, the CPO cannot talk to you or the, you know, the CPO is telling you, we can't discuss this, we can't discuss that. So it's, it's, really, a, it, it's really like a fallacy. We, we have to determine where we are going um, seriously with the question of, of if we are talking uh, workers having to meet 2022 prices, then simply put, um, they must be um, in receipt of a 2022 salary. That is what happens in several jurisdictions and in, in, in other jurisdictions. You try to match your salary with the cost of living. That's what nobody's asking to, to become a millionaire overnight, but you have to match my salary, the cost of living and my salary must match, simply put. And, and um, we, we, it, it's really challenging and, and you know, it's an, 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 uh, really an, a level of injustice for any government or any system or any country to be able to say, well, workers must have restraint, um, <clears throat> but how much restraint must they, they have? When they put their, their hands in their, in their pockets, um, their, their fingers are going through the, the, you know, because their pockets are, are empty. So that um, it is something that I hope, and you spoke about the issue of um, uh, social dialogue and the issue of, of us being involved in this uh, in this tripartite arrangement, trade unions are not averse to having or being part of any social uh, genuine, and I, I I want to emphasize and meaningful. And meaningful social dialogue. We are not in social dialogue where you have already made your decision and you call us today or tomorrow for a photo opportunity, so that tomorrow's headline in the newspapers will say that that you know we met with we met with unions and you know there, there's a photo up and then the workers look at us cocky eye and say but government say or, or the employers say they you know they, they met with you all so you all have agreed so we are quite willing um, to engage in in genuine social dialogue where each party has an equal seat and, and say and contribution at the table. We are not prepared to be part of social dialogue where it's a top-down um, arrangement or where we see in advance statements being made by certain government ministers, this is what will happen or this is what will not happen. At, and you make that statement at 10 o'clock, but then you call us to a meeting at 2 p.m., but you have already made your statement for the press at 10 a.m. stating yes. what will yes. happen. So when you call me to a meeting at 2, what is it to say? You just no want to say you just want a photo opportunity. So that yes. type of social dialogue, we will not uh, we will not support, but we are prepared to sit with the ECA. We did it for COVID-19 issues. We are prepared to sit with the chambers if necessary. We're prepared to sit with civil society, any group, but that it has to be an engagement of, of, uh, of genuineness. And the last thing I would say, because I heard it mentioned a couple of times about trade unions representing um, maybe 22, 23%. The reality is that the trade union movement in Trinidad and Tobago represents all workers. Not all of them may be formal members of a union because anything that happens in the workplace, um, what do people, they want to know what is the trade unions, trade union movement's position on this? What are trade unions saying about this? So when we go to meet with, whether it be the state, the government, uh, at whatever, forum we go to. We do not go just to represent the members who have a signed application form saying they are a member of BIGU or they are a member of, of PSA. We go to represent the work, working class 
of Trinidad mm -hmm. and Tobago. Mm -hmm. And that's who we represent. Um, so when we speak, we are not just speaking. We, we represent the CPEP workers, even though they are not members of unions. When we talk minimum wage, it's trade unions that, that, that argues and advocates for minimum wage um, with government. But our members are not minimum wage workers, but we are the ones who have to advocate that. So trade unions are in the, uh, are in, in, in the, our role is to represent the working class of Trinidad and Tobago, notwithstanding um, our membership may be a, in a narrower bandwidth, but we speak for and on behalf of the working class of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you so much, Trevor. Um, we can rewind all close to winding down. Keston, any last remarks? <laughs> well, thanks for that. Um, very interesting, and as Trevor said, this, this requires another Segment, but this is what we have. I want to expressly thank the, the Cipriani Labor College and its management for hosting this, because I think we need more of these. We need yes. to have conversations where people can listen, they can participate, so that they can make better and more informed decisions, rather than spending a lot of time on this social media that is creating so much trouble and mayhem, you know, because when you get on that track, there's no turning back. So I want to congratulate the Cipriani Labor Co College on the management for, for putting this, you know, this three-part series on. And would like to say in closing that this is not difficult. <laughs> this, this journey is not difficult. What is required is parties to the conversation as is embodied in the process of social dialogue, mutual respect, trust, trust okay, <laughs> and a willingness to come together and arrive at a common shared understanding. I say this over and over because that is what it is, a common shared understanding as to what is in our best interest. interest. Not in the interest of one party, our best interest. And we have enough information in front of us to hold hands, to be willing to hold hands as we go out into the world to make and create a better future for all of us in Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you. Uh, Trevor, and I want to thank you and Trevor because I know your hands are full and pretty busy with a lot. Taking the time off to do this says to us that you are interested in contributing to finding a solution that is best suited to the interests of all. So I want to thank you, the panelists. I want to also thank Elma Francois, Institute for Research and Debate, and the college for allowing me the opportunity to dialogue with you all as well as the participants for tuning in, the questions made the conversation even interesting. As a reminder, I want to remind you all, tomorrow we are on. So please don't upset yourself. It promises to get better and better. So tomorrow we are on at five. The topic tomorrow, please, you know, is never let a good crisis go to waste. And on Wednesday, we culminate with a session on the arts and renaissance. We at the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies, we aim to ensure that the issues that are impacting our daily lives, we provide a forum for discussion and discourse because we believe that we can help in finding the solution together. And I want to agree with both parties, dialogue, collaboration, compromise, they are all important to the journey ahead. Let us not despair. Let us utilize the opportunity to find new ways of doing things, simpler ways of doing things and more cost-effective. The only how we can do this is if we continue to engage each other in a meaningful way. And, and Trevor, I want to agree with you. Meaningful discussion and dialogue meaningful collaboration, trust. And I agree so much with Keston on that because a lot of what we see
turns out to be contrary to what we do. And therefore we say, whatever we say, we want to translate that into action. Cypriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies wants to provide that opportunity to all stakeholders to utilize our platform, to dialogue on issues and chat the way forward. Again, we want to thank the panelists. We cannot thank you all enough for saying yes to coming and discussing where the viewing and listening public can hear directly because very often they go in, in little pits and little corners to get advice and they're misled. All right, a lot of the truths are not available, but I know when they come on this forum, they hear the truth, can ask their question. We encourage them to continue to send in their questions. So if it couldn't be answered today, we would answer it at another time and publish it. So we have a more informed public that can make more informed decisions. Again, thank you, viewing and listening audience. Thank you, Kester. Thank you, Trevor. And we would just to bid you all. It's been my pleasure. And thanks to you, moderator. Mm -hmm. Thanks to you, Janice. And Trevor, well done. Thank you. Thanks to you, uh, Janice. Thanks to you, Keston. Have a pleasant evening. Have All a the pleasant best. evening. Bye-bye. Thanks to the Bye. listener. Thank you. Bye.